big welcome back to the Forger Head Show, episode 12. Nailed it this week. First off, not bad. Episode 12, who thought it? So today I've got an amazing guest for you. Uh, the Forger Head Show, as you guys may know, is um, all about bringing to you the storytellers, is bringing to you people that have been from adversity to excitement, people that are leading the way in um, inspiring other people. And today is absolutely no exception. A uh, lot of kind of commonalities as well. So excited for this one. But before we get to that point, I've got to thank our sponsors because you won't record the video otherwise. Um, so big thanks to Dougie Stone Radio, namely Mark Brimson. He hosts a whole range of fantastic internet radio shows from pop to 90s to indie, you name it, it's fantastic. So please do check them out. They are freaking global. Link is in the bio below. Um, so big thanks to Dougie Stone Radio. And I said today for episode 12, I'm really excited to be bringing it to you, the one and only Beth Allen. Now, Beth, we crossed our paths on Twitter before I left, and I'm sure we come on to that. Um, and that's a really big part of what I want to chat about with Beth today because her following online is awesome, absolutely amazing. She is uh, an award-winning, double award-winning mental health YouTuber and public speaker, working in very similar spaces, education, corporate organizations, um, sharing her story from uh, illness to recovery and some amazing things she's got going on right now. So, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it's Beth Allen. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> You're literally like one of the, the most positive people that I know. Like every interaction we've had has been just like leaves you feeling better than before. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, Beth, um, where, where are you from like, geographically? Not that it really matters right now because it's been recorded in lockdown and stuff. But where are you from? I am from Nottingham, Robin Hood okay. country. Yeah, yeah, Midlands. Right. Right, so. Good stuff. So tell uh, our listeners, our watchers, depending on where they're watching or listening to this, tell us about you. So that's a big subject. It's huge. <laughs> it's a good starting point though. It is, isn't it? It's awesome. Well, I, my name is Beth, as you said. I am currently a life coach, a YouTuber, you name it. I'm everything. Um, and I guess my story really started at a very early age when I was about 10 years old. Um, I developed something called emetophobia, and which then developed into GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, and then into anorexia. So three big ones uh, at the age of 10 already. And basically I share my story um, navigating the brutality of mental illness throughout my childhood and my teenage life to becoming the most well I've ever been in my life in my early 20s and hoping to even just spark a tiny bit of inspiration into the world that, you know, mental illness is not. A, like an ending it's not a sentence you you can overcome and life can be something that you, you didn't even imagine my life honestly right now is I, I would never have even imagined it if you'd have told 10 year old me you get to 24 you will be the most well you've ever been and you won't have to worry about eating you won't have to worry about emetophobia I would never have believed you so that's kind of a little snippet about me <laughs> wow what a snippet that's huge <laughs> I mean, that is so um, there's lots of different things I want, I want to go down, but in order, Nick, keep focused, right? Okay, first thing, um, emetophobia, that's not been on my radar before. Can you tell me about that? Really? So have you never heard of it before? No, not at all. Wow, that's, that's not, that doesn't actually surprise me because a lot of people tell me that they've never heard of it before. But it is the fourth most common phobia in the world. Wow crazy so anyway yeah emetophobia is the intense fear of vomiting or, or being sick or being around people that are sick in general so yeah I, I picked that up at about the age of 10 I can remember the day clear as day when it developed because usually with emetophobia there is a specific event and it creates from that and it can absolutely snowball it's one of the most incredible and, and honestly heartbreaking things that I've ever been through is living with the metaphobia. Um, so yeah, there was a specific incident with me. Um, my family and me, we all got a really nasty virus over the Christmas period of 2005. It was, I mean, nobody likes being sick, do they? It's, it's no. not nice. 
<laughs> um, but basically what happened with me, there was so much kind of energy. There was so my parents were all being sick and my sister was being sick. Everybody was really fraught and I felt like I was going to die. And being a 10 year old, it's hard to kind of rationalize, oh, we're, you know, we're all sick. It's going to be okay. We're all going to get better. I thought we were all going to die. And it sounds so dramatic and so silly, but it's honestly, emetophobia usually develops in children and lives with you through until adulthood. And you know, the world of kind of neurology, once it gets set in there, it can be very difficult as you get older to kind of redirect those thoughts. Mm. That's a little bit about it. It goes on. So given the, and thank you for being so candid and sharing that. It's, it's a real <laughs> eye-opener. I mean, it's interesting that GAD this is a shared challenge, shall we say. That was that was a, yeah. a key part of my, my journey. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's very similar in terms of the awareness. Actually, statistically, it's more common, but less commonly known. So when I mention things about OCD, about obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah, everyone's heard of that. Obsessive cleaners on Channel 4 and all the things that trivialize it. Um, yeah. Then... Um, but it raises the awareness. But actually, GAD, but statistic, uh, statistic, blah blah blah, statistically more common. Oh, <laughs> do, do you know I sometimes, I sometimes wish I didn't say like I'm never gonna kind of stop and I'm not gonna edit. I'm just gonna keep the mistakes in. But there we go. Uh, there we go. So, so you mentioned anorexia as well. Um, so, did that have any link with the um, emetophobia? Was there a, a, a kind of a connection there? Yeah, massively. The two worked really well together. And according to the many kind of psychologists and therapists that I saw, they often come as a package deal. Um, and so, yeah, with an anorexia, you usually think of somebody wanting to lose weight, don't you? That's, that's kind of a common term, you know, the idea around it that we have. For me, it wasn't about losing weight per se, although it did develop into that. Um, it was all about, I don't want to eat because I think I'm going to get sick. And you know how powerful the brain is. You can convince yourself after every meal that you feel sick, that you've eaten something wrong, that your body is going to reject it. And so I was honestly really quite poorly. Um, and I was really underweight. I think my lowest was around about four and a half stone at the age of about 15. Yeah. I was really not good. So how, what was your process in terms of seeking help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to CAMS, you know, Children, Adolescents, Mental Health. Yeah. Um, I went to them a few times as a kid, but it was six weeks long and it wasn't enough because I had no idea where all this had stemmed from. Uh, you know, I can pinpoint it now and say, oh, yes, I know the time and the day and, and everything that's happened because of it. But at that age, I had no freaking clue. You know, I was like, what the hell is going on? I'm crazy. There's something wrong with me. And this is going to be my life. Um, so I went to CAMS for a bit. I went three times. It didn't work for me. I had CBT and it just didn't gel. It was like the sticking plaster, I think, that a lot of people call CBT. Um, yeah. So then I kind of avoided therapy because I thought it didn't work. Um, and then I went back at the age of 21. And I had something called humanistic integrative therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that. I read that on your bio. And again, not a clue, but really <laughs> interested to learn. I'll, be, I'll always be honest with you. <laughs> no, yeah, I love it. I love it. Bringing the knowledge. Yeah. No, humanistic integrative therapy. I started that at 21. And I had two years of that. So I finished at the end of my 23rd year. And uh, yeah, it, it honestly changed my life. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go into what humanistic integrity of therapy is. Please do, yeah. It's honestly, not, a lot of people haven't heard of it as well, you know. Um, it's a very new thing, I think. Um, I could be totally wrong on that. It was new for me. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> That's all so, about this. Lived experiences exactly. like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's so cool. Um, it's, it's a lot more about the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, and I was not like a spiritual person before um, my parents, you know, I was, gr I grew up as Christian um, and I kind of rebelled against religion, you know, teenage years. I was like, eh, I don't believe in it. I don't want to because my parents believe in it. Um, and so I went to humanistic integrative therapy and we started talking about, you know, my spirit, my soul um, and all this kind of stuff. And 
it was really quite uncomfortable to be honest for a long time but it was only until I realized that I had to go that deep I had to kind of challenge that and understand who I am and get down to the root before I could even begin to attempt to get better so it was it was very uncomfortable to be honest and I was drained a lot um, after my sessions but yeah I bet it was, it was amazing, honestly. Humanistic integrative therapy. If you've never had it, God, you've got to try it. So how, how did you discover that? Were you, is that something you were referred in or is that just something alternative that you found? I had, honestly, the, the waiting lists we all know are intense for NHS, aren't they? Yeah. It, it's a mess. Um, it's honestly something that is really dear to my heart. I just, I, I hate seeing that. But I had to go uh, private because I was literally at the point where it was like do or die as, as candid as I can it was do or die um and so I'm very lucky that I have parents with the income and the savings to be able to spend honestly I hate to think how much they spent on my therapy it was probably thousands you know um, yeah. going to therapy every single week um so yeah it was private I went a, a week every week for two years and it just changed my life Sounds amazing. I'll be, I'll be definitely researching this when I, when I finish this. It does sound amazing. And I think that's the thing. It's kind of, I'm not sure if you find this, but um, it's people that are out there delivering a message and trying to inspire other people to use their adversities to, to, to forge something better. Um, that there's a misconception that it's kind of like, hallelujah, they're cured. And it's yeah. not, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I manage my stuff daily. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I think I had that battle as well between like, oh, am I cured? Am I not? Because you, know, you have a really great time and you feel like better. And then all of a sudden you have a panic attack and you're like, where the hell did that come from? You know, and I think what humanistic integrative therapy did for me was remind me that I'm human. You know, yeah. that I'm not going to be perfect um, and I'm going to have the down days I'm, and that's just going to happen. But I think a massive part of what it teaches you is that you can stay strong, you can stay grounded on those days and they will pass. You know, you bend like the tree, you don't break. Yes, I love that. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. And actually it's maintaining the same process when you feel well. And I think that's the other thing that people tend to, I guess it's kind of like praying for a lot of people that they only pray when they're kind of up shit creek kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I yeah. think it's actually maintaining that when, when it's done well, because there's always going to be things, I mean, pandemics for a start, but there's some like big world issues going on at the minute. Um, racism, bad politics, potential mm -hmm. wars all over the place and always going to be very easily overwhelmed. And I think that's the thing. It's to, is to accept that actually you cannot control the uncontrollable, but what we have got is a choice of how we proactively go into each and every day. And I yeah. think the problem is, and we've both been there, that when we, when we struggle, whether that be with mental health, mental illness, or even low self-esteem, low self-confidence, mm -hmm. that um, the first thing we sacrifice is choice. Um, and I'm so pleased that you deliver your message to the schools in particular, everybody generally, but in particular for this point, the schools, because when I deliver talks around uh, anxiety and OCD around in schools, that I'm very, very careful to stick to what I know yeah. and not to go into the things that I don't know. And I know, mm -hmm. especially with young girls, that actually things like anorexia, things like bulimia, eating disorders, actually that's a real challenge um, around and connected to mental health. So um, how do you deliver your message to different audiences? So do you, obviously it's the same theme, Mm -hmm. obviously the delivery style of how you engage students as opposed to lawyers for example there is a big difference <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, <they're never laughs> i mean i suppose the the way that i like to approach it is i that there we all have an inner child right and so whether you're talking to students who are not that far away from their inner child or you're speaking to lawyers who are, you know, they, they're a bit more experienced, they're that bit older, they may have forgotten that inner child, but it's still there. Um, I like to cater to the inner child. And I, I, I love that because we, we can all go there. We can all go there and visit that child. Um, it, is, it is a really, really wonderful thing to do. And it's interesting to watch how people change as you deliver the message and you communicate to that side of them. And they're like, 
you know, lawyers will go from like this to, you know, really chill out and like laughing. <laughs> you know, it's all about just loosening up, I think, for me. I think mental health can be a really difficult topic at times. Um, and I want to kind of shift the way that we see that. For sure, there's absolutely, you know, it, it can be heartbreaking, you know, life-threatening. And it's important to remember that. But it can be joy. It can be, you know, challenge. It can be growth. It can be positive as much as, you know, it is negative. And I really like to kind of drive that home that we don't have to, you know, sit up straight and pretend that we're paying attention and be serious about this. This is mm -hmm. safe. And, you know, we can afford to kind of loosen up and, and talk about these things. I think that's a nail on the head. It's that kind of thing where the reason why people don't engage in mental health initiatives or wellbeing initiatives is because they feel it's a classroom environment. They're going to be fixed or at all. And actually, people don't necessarily want that. Essentially, like in life, people just want to be heard. They want to be understood. And actually, if those two things are fulfilled, then most people will find their own way forward. The problem yeah. is nowadays, they don't feel heard. Genuinely, don't feel heard. And no. the lived experience piece, um, I kind of, try and describe it to people is uh, like a vehicle that it takes organizations from the problem of mental health to the solution but I ain't the solution <laughs> by a long stretch but what I do do is increase engagement so mm -hmm. by sharing stories like we both do as storytellers for me I think that it's the most powerful engagement tool to increase engagement in the solutions but we're yeah. not necessarily the solution no, I totally, yeah, I really hear that. I think I totally agree with you, actually. Storytelling is kind of a lost art, you know, in our society today, and it's what we need. We need to hear these stories, you know. I, on my channel, on my YouTube channel, um, I'm not trying to plug anything, on my YouTube no, channel. Please do, and by the way, the link will be in the bio. I always want to make sure that that's directed to you, so that's cool. Oh, bless you, thank you. Honestly, on my YouTube channel, I, I have a series called Hold My Hand, where... I kind of go, well, before COVID, thanks COVID, um, I, I used to go around and meet people and we talk about their story as openly and candidly like we are now, right? Yeah. Um, and I've met some amazing people and learned some incredible lessons, you know, one of, one of I mean, I don't have favorites, but one of the most <laughs> interesting people that I had was I met a guy called Greg who, you know, had an accident and he was in a coma for a really long time and he was about to get switched off life support and as they were about to turn it off, he woke up and he, you know, wow. depressed before he was, you know, he was honestly, he would say it himself. He was not a, you know, a great person. He could have been better. He could have been kinder. And, you know, he, it totally changed his life. And wow, wow, wow. That's so impactful, aren't they? So you don't have mm. to go through that to gain something from it. You're quite right. I think, but it seems to be, not so much a dying art, but I think it's it really stands out when you do see and feel and hear the storytellers at the. So I run kind of speaking academy days every month, and but the focus is not on presentation skills. That that ain't me at all. Uh, it's on <laughs> it's on emotional storytelling. It's about how do we deliver emotion, and of the the twenty cohort or, or kind of attendees, of them, they're made up from people that yeah they want to be stage speakers or they want to go pro or they want to be able to sell or network or whatever but actually a good chunk of people just want to be heard in their relationships mm -hmm. so actually unless we can convey a message any message with, with power and emotion and clarity it has a, an ultimate defining effect on success by our own definition and i think that's the bit that we don't see about storytelling mm -hmm. actually that it can limit us as well as yeah. empower us um, the three exercises that I do in the morning are asking people to deliver like a, a talk on something that they hate because people are not good at that, but they need to know how they sound when they deliver hate because it's uncomfortable. But, but literally, so it, it's like, it's not changing the message. It's not making the message disingenuous. It doesn't change the, the sincerity, but it means that you can amplify that message to an audience like we both do. Yeah. Same with sadness and regret. It's a really difficult emotion to convey whilst maintaining your own emotions and protecting yourself. Yeah. And then, of course, love. You can't have both without the other. So uh, then we have love. And how do we deliver love? And people can hear you smile and lots of different things. And um, yeah. it's really fascinating that just people just take that for granted. We can take that for granted sometimes that actually just the ability to say what people believe with yeah. courage and confidence and conviction 
has, has such a defining effect on people. And I love what you've put in your bio, but actually that's why you see your role now, is to actually kind of give people permission to, to be a better version of themselves. Yes. Yeah, I think so many people can be made uncomfortable by the idea of becoming better. I know that I certainly did. The idea of going to therapy and having to go through change. I had this weird idea that life wasn't going to change unless I let it, which is because life is changing all the time, right? So <laughs> yeah. for some reason I thought I had control over this and I really didn't. And it was only when I realized that if I relinquish that control and even just tried to become better, what have I got to lose? I was literally depressed, miserable, no prospects, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And like, how could I go lower, really? You know, mm -hmm. so I just, I love to communicate with people, understand where they're at. You know, I want to know what makes them tick. I want to see how we can go even further, you know, push the boundaries further. Where can we go? It's just, it's so much fun. But it, the, the way that you convey that actually comes across electronically as well. So your YouTube channel is awesome and you should definitely check out the link that's in the bio. Um, oh. But when you watch a video of yours, it feels like you're talking to them in person, to yourself in person. And okay. I think that's, because it comes from a place of authenticity, that mm -hmm. you're, you're one of the people that share the downs as well as the ups. Yeah. You share the challenges as well as the successes. Um, wow. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I, I did um, an email kind of a, a mailer, I guess, or and also a, an article on LinkedIn about that last week, about mm -hmm. that actually three weeks ago, I just reached a point where I just needed to switch off. I got to a point where... It, I think the great thing about going through mental health challenges before, as I'm sure you appreciate, you do have the courage to make those decisions quickly when you feel it's not going your way. Yeah. Actually, off. that's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that step back meant that I could then recharge and, and, and review and lots of different things. But it took until Friday of that week to actually unwind. That's how much yeah. we carry. Even the people that, and it's so much easier to tell other people what to do than to do it yourself, right? Yeah. Don't, don't leave me hanging here, that's right. <laughs> no, that, that hit me so hard, I had to take a breath. You know, that's so true. Yeah, so uh, but actually coming back, I feel, I feel great again. You just need to take that step back, take a step forward. And yeah. So you made a decision to, um, to start your own social media streams, to, to really put yourself out there. What, how, how was that born? How was that idea born? And how did you start that? That's a good question. It, I think um, Twitter, I, I obviously I have a Twitter, an Instagram and a YouTube and uh, I started YouTube first, uh, I think it was about three years ago and just making videos about mental health, you know, videos about this is, you know, GAD, this is emetophobia, this is just to get something out there and also for myself because I was in a process of trying to understand it and figure it out for myself so it was like my own form of therapy I suppose. Um, and I just upload them and I got a Twitter and an Instagram just to promote what I was doing. Um, and somehow, well, it was very by accident, really. <laughs> Twitter seemed to take off really quickly. Um, and all of a sudden I had like thousands and thousands of followers and I was like, what in the heck? Like, how did that happen? But, you know, it, it was beautiful. I've communicated with people all over the world about, you know, mental health and, and keeping healthy and things like that. Instagram, I'm still figuring out. <laughs> that, that's one that kind of has eluded me for a while, but I really want to get to grips with that now. But it's interesting that you talk about how you needed to switch off from it because I've definitely gotten to that point, especially recently with Twitter. Mm. And I don't know how you felt about Twitter because you had an Instagram, didn't you, as well? Or Yeah, I was. So I, I'm really pleased we're chatting about this because it, it's something that's it's been really relevant it's a month ago around a month ago where i decided to pull the plug on the yeah. social social media so instagram facebook and twitter now what i found was that over lockdown i started to build this like self-care routine uh, of, of kind of a walk at least five and a half miles every day meditate lots of different things and i felt great and my energy was good and then i would scroll and i would feel terrible within seconds or the other thing was that i found um a lot of kind of superficial behavior um mm -hmm. A lot of things that were kind of masks, and um, me and masks are not good. Um, and there was just a lot of things. I, I, like I said, there are big world events going on, pandemics and racism and um, bad politics and kind of every country kicking off against every country, all that kind of stuff. But what was funny, it was playing out on timelines. And 
what I found was the first maybe three months of lockdown were there was a groundswell of compassion that everyone mm-hmm. just seemed to show the best of themselves. Yeah. And then it changed. Mm-hmm. And then I found that they're just it was it was quite toxic, if I'm honest. Yeah. And and like you, given the fact that the social media absolutely represents a, a bit a, a biggish chunk of my business, mm-hmm. that for me, it was, my mental health was still worth more than the biggest chunk of my business. Yeah. So I cut it, and yeah. I must admit, I feel a lot better for it without the notifications and the. Uh, I love your take on this. So what I found was Twitter, especially given the fact that you mentioned that specifically, that people would post for inspiration or desperation, but very rarely in between. So you've got the extremes, and actually, mm-hmm. for, for people like us who would like to engage people, it's really difficult because we're following that <laughs> kind of routine all the time, or catching people at different times. And I think when you get into a step of, or get into a position of looking after people, it's something I've been using when I've been speaking recently, is who looks after the people who looks after people. Mm. So they are naturally more sensitive to take on the burden of other people. And when you've got your own stuff to manage, it can be quite tough. Um, yeah. So for me, there was that element, but also the more that I rose my head above the parapet, the more I was speaking about stuff and raising mm. the profile, the mm. more negative attention I was getting as well. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I've actually found well-being as an industry, like mega sensitive for a start, but also after a, a, a career in corporate sales, far more competitive in terms of its, its nature um, really? than, than corporate sales. It's crazy. Wow. So lots of different things culminated in that kind of decision through, okay, done, and I moved away. And it took about two weeks of me f- feeling really, really anxious mm-hmm. uh, of thinking the world was trying to get hold of me in, re- in, re- in reality. Nothing was trying to get hold of me, to be fair. But <laughs> um, LinkedIn had to stay because 90% of my business is done through LinkedIn. Um, yeah. YouTube stayed because actually I enjoyed doing that. I needed, still yeah. needed an outlet. I still wanted to mm-hmm. talk to people like yourself on, on these yeah. shows. and. Um, so yes, that's kind of my experience, but mm-hmm. as somebody who's like even more active on social media, <laughs> how do you, you've obviously, you said you may have reached that point where you feel a little bit like that, but in terms of mm-hmm. self-protection against negativity, how, how do you do that? How do you do that? Beth, how do you do it? <laughs> I, I wish I could give you the cure. I really do. <laughs> when you figure it out, tell me, but I will. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's intense and you have to protect your energy. You just have to. It's, it's impossible to be successful on social media if you're not taking time out and, and protecting your own bubble, you know. Um, and I definitely got sucked in. It's so easy to get sucked in and very much similar to you, you know. I'd be having a great day and i start scrolling and then it's like, oh, and, and you take on that that energy and you know someone else's really bad day or or the you know the issues in the world you take it on and you don't even know Mm. it's really it's so intense i was feeling physically ill um you know mentally it was just not a good place to be um and even as much as recently (laughs) i've been using an app um to upload tweets for me so i don't have to go there you know (laughs) i don't want to go there right now it's been such a challenging place and i it's it's kind of sad really because i love twitter i've met so many great people from there like yourself you know and and, you know collaborated and made some great things together but the overall kind of oh it just feels like angst you know it just feels like a place of angst and I it does. don't want that in my life, you know. <laughs> so hard to get rid of my own angst. I don't. <laughs> this other angst. <laughs> so especially for somebody like you who likes to engage with. I mean, you were pretty much engaged with each and every person that responded to you. Yeah. And whoa, that must have been time consuming first and foremost. Yes. Um, especially kind of into the evening as well. I guess I was always trying to set a limit, but it's it's difficult not to just kind of like. I'm not, that's the one thing. My screen time actually went down from three hours sixteen minutes a day to twelve minutes a day. Whoa. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I literally don't hardly put this thing out there unless the Wi-Fi drops out. I need a personal hotspot, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> don't get me started on Wi-Fi providers. <laughs> anyway, so, um, <laughs> but it, yeah, and I think that there was also a noticeable kind of, um, it seems to be like a new breed of, of uh, passive aggression coming through. Mm. That actually people didn't really know where to go with how they were feeling, so they tend to be passing it on to other people. <laughs> and, yeah. and that manifested itself in different ways, but actually when you take a step back, it's really noticeable. 
Yeah, it's so true. And I think it doesn't really matter how positive you are. Um, you're still going to get in touch with those people that are struggling and they will mm. make it out on you. And I think that's a lesson I learned right in the early days of being on Twitter and on YouTube and on Instagram and what have you, you know, people act out of aggression and fear of their own situation in their own lives, but they take you down with them. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I, my heart goes out to them, honestly. I mean, I had a guy even last week, I think it was, I put out a tweet. I, I like to put out positive tweets because, you know, I want to do something a little bit different. Um, and, and I put out something like, I can't even remember what it was, but it was something like, you know, great people are made in times of difficulty, right? You know, you're, you're a great person, keep going, something like that. I hope I articulated it better. Um, and, he comes at me and, he, and, he, and he says something like, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know that I'm great. You know, I might be terrible. And I'm like, okay, okay. Am I just supposed to say that you're not terrible, you know, that you're, you are terrible even? And, you know, we had this really long conversation, actually, and mm. I have a habit of making friends with my trolls. <laughs> and eventually, you know, we talk it out, usually via DM, and uh, they, they keep following, and they'll interact with my stuff, and, you know, they'll be friends after that. It's, it's really interesting to start to kind of change the viewpoint of a troll to a friend in need. You know, and sometimes they'll listen and sometimes they won't. It, but it's not on you. Really important to remember. You can't Yeah, do. that's interesting. I think, I think it ties in with, uh, obviously, as we both know, there's a strong link between mental health challenges for sure and, and kind of people pleasing, so giving mm -hmm. ourselves away. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad you've managed to win people around. But actually, that whole pursuit just kind of, I don't know, you kind of, you end up down a like kind of a, like Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole, don't you? Kind of say, like, ah, there's a small path to go here now and I don't know where to go. And, it's difficult <laughs> but so yeah it's, it's it'll be interesting to see where that journey kind of takes you really i think because the, uh, we're both very active in terms of signposting and, and trying to help people in our own way but also knowing actually what that cutoff is as well i mean both morally and also kind of professionally knowing what yeah. that cutoff is and then that's difficult because obviously we're encouraging people to have those conversations mm -hmm. but then we're also trying to encourage people to, to signpost to go where they need to go with that yes it's tough it's a tough balance really mm -hmm. it is it is difficult especially when you just want to help you know and it's interesting that you say people pleasing i i mean i've stayed up multiple nights till early hours of the morning talking to people that are suicidal and, and things like that because they don't want to call anybody and it, you have to be so careful because that there's i don't want to sound awful but there, there is a way that people can take advantage without knowing um, yeah. And you, you've got to protect yourself from that. And they need the help that they deserve as well at the same time. You know, so it's, it's a very difficult balance. If anybody was going to go online and start a mental health account to support other people, I would say you have to protect your own energy, your own space. Yeah. Almost. Clearly defining your, your boundaries really, isn't it? Managing, and also managing expectations as well. Yeah. So I noticed here that you were, I mean, this probably kind of contributed to, to kind of the people that were coming to you, but you work for a Stop Suicide campaign. You work for um, lots of different initiatives, but also, excitingly, won <laughs> <laughs> Mental Health Blog Awards, Mental Health Vlogger of the Year, two years running. Recently, the past two years before this one as well. Well done. Yeah. Big round of applause for that one. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know how it happened, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. I love the blog awards i don't know if you know mike douglas who runs them um no. but he, oh you need to connect with him you he would be great on your podcast actually <laughs> he's oh, yeah, yeah seriously he's so great he's he does so much for the cause um and that blog awards has literally happened a week ago i think it was um so yeah it's, it's wonderful it's a great environment that's cool that's really good so <laughs> i think we've covered everything i definitely wanted to cover <laughs> yes i'm sure we have anyway so the most important question of the whole session. This is what everybody tunes in for. Mm -hmm. I am the new MC at O2 Arena. Okay. Congratulate me. <laughs> Congratulations, sir. Much. I'm not ready, but there we go. I'm, <laughs> I'm just about 20,000 people sell out crowd of book tickets to come and see you speak. And I'm mm -hmm. just about to announce you, bring you to the stage. What would your walk on music be? You know what? Uh, there's so many options, but a song that means so much to me, I'm a big MJ fan, Michael Jackson. 
And uh, Man in the Mirror has to be one of my favorite. Oh, tune. Yeah. Great tune. Love that. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. So where can, I'm going to pop the links in the bio, but tell us, for those listening on the, on the podcast as well, where can people find you, Beth? You can find me on Twitter at A Healing Queen, and you can find me on Instagram at A Healing Queen, and you can also find me on YouTube as A Healing Queen. <laughs> Excellent. And that's now triggered another question that I should have asked you, but my memory's shocking. So you rebranded uh, from Real Miss Anxiety to The Healing Queen. Yes. You told me the reason behind that before, but mm-hmm. share with us what that, because I think that's a really important part of like, you kind of flourishing into what you're doing now. So yeah. explain the decision that you took to take you from real miss anxiety to the healing queen. Yes, it was a big decision. I'd been thinking about it for a year before I even did it. Um, and it was scary. Miss anxiety was my kind of alias while I was ill. And lots of people knew me as someone who was mentally ill. And as I moved into recovery, I thought, this is holding me back. It's tugging me. I could feel the weight of the name, Miss Anxiety. And I just thought, I can't go by this name anymore because it's not me. I'm not Miss Anxiety. I'm not anxious. I'm, I'm better. I'm getting better. Um, so I waited for ages. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what am I going to call myself? You know, because I think, I think it's like a stage name is a cool, fun thing to do. And I just love yeah. it. So I was brainstorming one day and I just thought the healing queen because I feel like all of us are healing into being the king or the queen of our lives. And that is the main message that I want to put out there that where you are right now doesn't have to be where you're going to stay and you have the power. So the healing queen became my new little name that we got going on. (laughs) Amazing. And actually like you're so professional, you just slipped into the part in wisdom as well. (laughs) <laughs> as if you've done this before so all right <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. honestly really love having you on today thank you so much i think what you're doing is wonderful uh mm-hmm. thank you for your clarity and openness about what you share as well um i'm sure i appreciate that and i'm sure the people that are tuning into this appreciate that as well yeah. so big thank you to beth allen i'm going to give you another i love round of applause keep the energy up. Big round of applause for beth allen. thank you thank, thank you, you so for having much me. being on here today really appreciate it Um, And join us for episode 13 coming up very shortly. We have Stefan Thomas, who is the author of Business Networking for Dummies. Um, So he is the networking guru bringing you him in the next week or so. Really excited for that one as well. Um, So stay tuned and I will look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.